I mentioned earlier that you are called sometimes the father of modern hip resurfacing and that's because you were the inventor of the Birmingham hip resurfacing device. Now that device is the new generation hip resurfacing and that's what you're, you were talking about that has been around with excellent results. So can you tell us a little bit about the background of why that is so successful as opposed to some of these other devices that have been pulled from the market or discontinued? Well, I told you that I started with metal metal resurfacing in February 1991. And boy, did we learn a lot in the six years or six and a half years between putting in the first of my prototypes and the first Birmingham hip resurfacing. So six and a half years of learning about fixation, fixation of the cup, fixation of the femoral component, optimum orientation, optimum sector angles on the cup, um, optimum metallurgy. There was a lot of things to learn. And unfortunately, in some cases, learnt with much trouble uh, to both the surgeon and the patients. So having learnt a lot of lessons, we eventually designed and perfected what we thought was the ultimate metal on metal device, or metal metal resurfacing, the Birmingham hip resurfacing, and that was first put in in July uh, 1997. And from that time forward, uh, until the end of 2009, I've done 3,095 Birmingham hip resurfacings. And 12 years, eight months down the line, the survivorship in all patients, all ages, all diagnoses is 96%. So we've got good 12 and a half year uh, outcomes. Uh, there's trouble in some groups and lessons to be learned and implemented. And it's particularly relating to different diagnostic groups. The best group are men over the age of 60. At 12 and a half years, 99% of men over the age of 60 at the time of their surgery have been successful. Men under the age of 60, 98%. Now, uh, why are the men under 60 slightly worse than the men over 60? The answer is that those numbers included patients with avascular necrosis of their femoral head. And avascular necrosis of the femoral head with resurfacing has a much higher failure rate. So 10% failure roughly at 10 to 12 years. So they have diluted the good results in the younger men. Still acceptable to 97, 98%. In women, the situation is a bit different. In my series, Women age 60 and over at the time of surgery have a 97% implant survival at 12 and a half years. Now you may say, wow, we were told that older women shouldn't have resurfacing. Yes. <laughs> and older women now turn out to be much better results than younger women. And that needs to be understood clearly the older women that I was carrying out resurfacing on. These were people who were really active. You know, doing three rounds of golf a week. I have a 72-year-old who was a triathlete. Wow. You know, these are active ladies. Good bone, nothing wrong with their bone. And they didn't have dysplasia, so they had regular osteoarthritis. And they have done extremely well at the 12 and a half year point. My troublesome group are women under the age of 60. And at 12 and a half years, they have a 90% implant survival. So worse than the older women. And it's very clear why that is now, is that they have a higher incidence of dysplasia. And in dysplasia, I'm sure you know well that there's a funny twist to the femur and a funny twist to the socket. 
and the combination of the excess twist on the femur and the excess antiversion on the socket means that they are more prone to edge loading of their acetabulum. And that can be perfectly easily dealt with by altering at the time of surgery the antiversion of the acetabular component to match the increased antiversion of the femoral neck. So we can deal with that, but we first got to know that that's what the problem is. So let me just tell you how that's played out. I have 10 patients who, in Oxford terms, have had a pseudotumor. Now, I presented my 10 pseudotumors out of 3,095 patients today, and I was told, actually, you only have one pseudotumor because nine out of my 10 pseudotumors had fluid-filled collect, uh, fluid collections. They were not solid pseudotumors at all, and none of them were associated with any soft tissue destruction. When those patients were redone to a total hip replacement, they have had no complications and a perfectly good outcome equivalent to a first-time total hip replacement. So that is quite, quite different to what has been described in pseudotumors from Oxford. I have one lady who has had a solid pseudotumor and osteolysis of her acetabulum, and we have filmed her. She's on my uh, McMinn Center website, and she has made a great recovery at the two-month uh, period when she was filmed, uh, when she came for her post-op review. So now that we know the troublemakers are young ladies, with dysplasia, with an abnormal twist of their femur, we can still do metal metal resurfacing, but we've got to adjust the angle of the acetabular component. And its accuracy with component implantation, that's the key to getting success in that group. So if I understand what you're saying, it sounds to me like with what you've learned, hip resurfacing in the future is going to be a lot more successful in all age groups, is that correct? Absolutely. What we've learned now is that there are very important aspects to design. So the bad designs, we now know the criteria that need to be removed. So we can get design much better than it has been. And we know the groups of patients who don't do so well with resurfacing at present. Uh, but in the case of women with dysplasia, we can adjust that uh, and still have success with resurfacing. But overwhelmingly, the major culprit in all this is the surgeon. If we don't put that device in accurately, it can fail. And that's a very unpalatable message for surgeons. We love to blame the implant or blame the patient. You did too much. A common story. The device was invented to allow people unrestricted activity. We can't come and blame the patient for doing too much. That's unreasonable behavior. I place no restriction on my patient's activity. I used to stop them doing parachuting and bungee jumping. And then I eventually was sent videos from two of my resurfacing patients. One man has done the highest bungee jump in the world. Nothing happened. And another one has done paragliding, and nothing happened. So now I've given up on even trying to stop them parachuting and bungee jumping. They can do whatever activity they like. But, of course, it's a question of when. And the when is when your bone returns to full strength. And uh, that's around one year. And uh, I, I like them to restrict impact loading until about a year. Mm -hmm.